this is what I'm going to preach on. Be a believer, not a beggar. Well, we just came through Thanksgiving, didn't we? And uh, Thanksgiving is a time of looking back. We, we look back at the great things that God has done. Um, I don't know if you take some time to go around the table and s- say what you're grateful for. Uh, we do that in our family. We don't do that before the meal. Otherwise, we come from such a talkative family that we'd never get to the food. And everybody's usually hungry by the time we sit down. Uh, so we do it after our meal. And again, it turns into an hour, two hours uh, of sharing. Uh, but I, I hope you did that. Now, what I'm realizing is when I was younger, when I was a kid, I because you know, our family did something like that too. You know, I, oh, do we have to do that thing again? But the older I get now, it's my favorite part of Thanksgiving, (laughs) even more than the food. I love the food. And even the prep time, that's kind of fun, too, you know, getting everything together and working together in the kitchen. That's fun. The meal's good. But, boy, I really look forward to the time of just sharing Um, because we're looking back. We're being grateful. And gratefulness is such a beautiful attitude uh, to have. Uh, but today, since Thanksgiving is in the past already, let's, let's keep moving now, right? We got Christmas. Let's, let's not slow down too long, right? Well, there's a lot to happen before the end of 21. But I want to suggest that we have, uh, 2020, <laughs> I want to suggest that we have a new holiday starting today. Are you ready? And let's call it Thanks Receiving. Thanks Receiving. Because we've already had Thanksgiving where we've looked back I want to suggest that Thanksgiving is about looking at what's ahead, thanking God in advance for what is yet to come. And really, that's what faith is. You want to wonder what faith is? What faith, Pastor? I have people talk about faith. You got to have faith. What's faith? Faith is simply that. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, probably the most revered chapter in maybe all the Bible is Hebrews 11. And here's, the writer says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us the assurance about the things we cannot see. I mean, that's a a great little phrase, and if you've been around church, you've heard it preached, you've heard, you've read that yourself, but boy, you pick that apart a little bit, and then you realize what comes after this in chapter 11 is all the heroes of the faith, the great stories, who had this kind of faith, they had that kind of confidence, and they had that kind of hope, and the results speak for themselves. So my challenge to you here today is, regardless of what situation you find yourself in, what challenge, what obstacle, what hopeless situation even, Can you take a moment here this morning and ask God to fill your heart with faith? I mean, God never answered a prayer. He never did something miraculous until faith was present, not one time. And he won't make an exception for you or I. So will you purpose, even this morning for the next 30 minutes, to to get in faith, to put in your thinking already of thanking God for what is yet to come. We may not know what it is. So I ask you here this morning, what what are you hoping for? What are you asking for in 2021? If I was to pass the microphone around this morning, I see some of you already get nervous, and you had an opportunity to answer that question. What are you asking for? What are you hoping for? Vocationally, of course, you know, financially, relationally, maybe spiritually? Could you, could you come up with a couple things? Or, or are you too busy scrolling, watching everybody else's life that you don't have time to sit and maybe think about your own life and maybe what God wants to do? Now, uh, I'll be honest with you. 2020 has been a train wreck. In, in many ways for, for us, for all of us. We've all had to adjust, and we're still adjusting, aren't we? I think we were hoping that once December 31st rolls around and the clock turns over to January 1st, that all of a sudden everything would, all the problems, COVID, all that would disappear, right? Well, I wonder if some of us are pushing back at that whole question, that whole idea. Like, 
What are you hoping for, asking for in 2021? We do this every year at the end of the year. But I'm so done with it. <laughs> like, what's the point? I mean, nobody hoped, nobody asked for COVID in 2020. Nobody asked for that, right? So one thing happens and everything is upset. Everything changes. It affects everything. So what's the point in even asking and praying and hoping? One little thing, one thing can happen and everything changes. So I wonder if we need to be very careful as people and as the church that we don't that we don't fill ourselves with such a spiritual discouragement that we bankrupt or we're bankrupt with faith. Or that we're f- so filled with skepticism now, spiritual skepticism, because so and so, a prophet, said this was going to happen. And I, I clicked on this video and I read this book and I, this post and, and that, and, and it didn't happen. And, you know, what I wish there was was a little prophetic humility where somebody who made this big prediction would come out and say, you know, I was wrong. (laughs) Sorry, I I was wrong. I I heard God wrong. I don't think we'll hear that. They'll probably just disappear until the next big thing, and then they'll come out again with their prediction. Can you you understand that there can be a a frustration in the body of Christ, a, a spiritual disappointment? Maybe your guy didn't get elected or, you know, this didn't happen according to all the things that you read. And we can become so skeptical that we stop dreaming, we stop having faith, we stop hoping. Let's just say what will be, will be. This is a really tough question, I think, in the context of the day and age we're living. I think we all need a little humility because we've all had our share of opinions and thoughts. And But with all of it, with looking back at 2020, with all of it, his faithful love endures forever. That's what we can hold on to. That's what we can stand on. In fact, we use that phrase at our Thanksgiving time. That verse comes from Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And here it is, his faithful love endures forever. Now this statement here is scattered throughout the Bible. It's said many times because it was something that the Jewish people would do when somebody would recount one of the great things that God did, an answer to prayer, uh, uh, defeat uh, of the enemy in battle, they would always say, his faithful love endures forever. So somebody would recount that, and the congregation, whoever would be there, would repeat, his faithful love endures forever. And it was faith building. And so we did that. That was Connie's idea. So what she did was uh, she opened the table up to say, okay, tell, I want you to share one challenge that, you, that God helped you get through in 2020. Share one obstacle, one difficulty you experienced. And then after everybody would share, we all said, and his faithful love endures forever. We all would say it together. So it was my turn. It was my turn to share. And I shared. And I, I said, I said uh, in 2020, this year, in March and April, I wanted to quit the pastor. I did. I was done. But I wasn't alone. About every preacher that I know of, it was really a difficult time to navigate a church through COVID. And again, you navigated business and employment and family and school, and I'm not saying woe is me. We all had to adjust on the fly, but I wanted to quit. I was, I was done. I was frustrated. In fact, I came to Connie. I had my list of six ways of revenue that, that I could keep our family going. I had six ways to make money. But I, I pushed through, I prayed through, I preached through those weeks and months, and really probably was preaching more to myself than even to you. You just got to kind of, you know, sit in on it a little bit. I had to preach to myself. Come July, I was on a prayer walk. I do that quite often, just take off and walk and I pray. And I remember that the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart, and he gave me this word. He said, assignment. He said, Mike, you're not finished with this assignment. 
you're not finished with this assignment. And don't quit early. Don't quit before this assignment is finished. You're not finished with your assignment. I can't tell you the, the load that was lifted in my spirit when, when I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me at that moment. And all of a sudden, a peace. This, the uh, Jehovah Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Man, I experienced God's peace that really made the struggle, even the questioning, even the doubting, made that all worth it to experience the peace of God like I'd never experienced before. And after that, man, there's just something got in my system, and I've, I've loved the pastorate. I've loved preaching. I've, I've been on a different level since then. And I think sometimes when we experience difficulty, when we experience the bad things of life, and 2020 has been that kind of year, it's easy to get so discouraged and get frustrated that we lose our ability to dream. We lose our ability to, to, to think and to have faith. But I want you to know that it's, it's through those difficult times that God is true to his word when, when he says God will cause everything to work together for the good. The focus of this is for the good, not on the everything bad that happened. But to focus on the good because he's working it out. And what happens when he's working it out and it's, it's a difficult situation, the difference that we experience from somebody who doesn't have faith or a firm foundation is, guess what? When those bad things happen, we don't lose our lives. We don't lose our faith. We don't fall apart at the seams. What happens is this, that obstacle, that challenge actually makes our faith strong. And then gives us the ability to begin to do something that I want to suggest we do here today as we look forward into this next year. But why wait 30 days? Why don't you start right now? Beginning to thank God ahead of time for what is yet to come. Now, whatever it is that you're praying for, believing for, a miracle, a promotion, um, whatever it may be in life, a financial provision, maybe a healing, uh, maybe a restoration in a relationship, maybe for your prodigal son or daughter to come back home, maybe for a prodigal parent to come back into your life, whatever you're believing for, it always takes patience, doesn't it? The things that we ask for don't come immediately. And I think it's on purpose because we know God is a good father and he wouldn't want to raise a bunch of spoiled brats who get what they want when they want it. So his timing is perfect and he knows he's a good father but it does require patience. You see, those things that we're believing for, that we're praying for, that we're declaring, maybe a promise that we're declaring over our life, they start out like seeds. They start out like seeds. When we pray, we're like planting a seed. Or God plants a dream. He plants something, uh, a promise in our heart. It's like a seed. And what happens after you plant that seed? There's the waiting season. There's the growing time. But that growing time is a time when we get strong. When that, when that little seed germinates and it pushes, maybe it's an apple, apple seed, it, it pushes through and then it looks like a little stick but it doesn't have any fruit yet, it may be years before it ever bears fruit because why? It's not strong enough to hold the fruit. And oftentimes when we pray, when we plant that seed, we need a growing season. We need a growing time so that we can be strong enough to handle the fruit that God has for us. But, until, but the, from the moment you plant that seed to the moment you harvest it, that's called faith. You want to know what faith is? That's what faith is. It's the moment you, you pray and believe for something, you ask God for something, and until you harvest it, that's what faith is. And that's where a lot of people get discouraged, and that's where a lot of people quit. That's where I wanted to quit. I wasn't seeing the harvest like I, I had hoped when with COVID and all the different things, maybe the soil seemed corrupted <laughs> and, and there, there was just, there's just this, this challenge. And, and I, I faced that time of discouragement. And for many of us, we feel that way. Like, oh, I've been praying about this. It's just taken too long. Maybe it'll never happen. You know, maybe it, it wasn't God. Maybe it was just me. And, and so we begin to question. But it doesn't mean that that seed is dead. It, 
that seed is still alive. It may be dormant. There may, might not be any fruit yet, but it's still alive. And we have to do our part in watering the seed. And how do we water the seed? By thanking God ahead of time. Complaining, being negative and pessimistic does not water that seed. It stunts that seed. We water that seed by thank, having faith to believe and thanking God ahead of time. And how do we do that? I mean, there's a, I'm going to suggest a couple things here this morning, but maybe, maybe for your situation, you're thinking about a medical report that you got, and maybe the doctor said it, it could be cancer, and all of a sudden that spirals you into thinking uh, you know, some negative thoughts and hopeless thoughts. But don't go by how you feel. Begin to believe and thank God ahead of time that the miracle is on his way, that his strength is on his way, regardless of what you experience along the way. Or maybe your finances are low, or maybe business has been slow. Instead of walking around all day just uh, negative with that, begin to believe that God wants you to be prosperous, that he wants you to be blessed so you can be a blessing, that he wants to give you the creativity and the ingenuity to create wealth. That comes from God. But if we're talking negative, if we're pessimistic about everything, that's not watering the seed. We water the seed by thanking God ahead of time. And that's what Abraham had to do. Abraham in the Old Testament, man, God gave him a promise of a son, but guess what? It took 24 years for Abraham to experience the the fruition of that promise. 24 years. Think about waiting 24 years for something. Could you wait 24 years? I can answer that for you. No, (laughs) I can't. I'm too impatient. I'm like you. I I want it now. But think, waiting 24 years. They could have easily talked themselves out of it. They were near 100 by the time they had the child. They were surrounded by negative people. It looked like an impossible situation. They, They could have easily talked themselves out of it. I mean, I mean, think about that. But the Bible says that Abraham grew strong in faith, and he did that by giving praise to God. And you won't stay strong in faith if you're complaining and if you're negative. Abraham stayed in faith. Again, I'm going to be a little vulnerable here this morning. But when we signed that sales agreement for that 40 acres several years ago, I mean, I was excited with, with all of us. I mean, what's a, what a great piece of property, lo- good location, a lot of room for us to expand. Man, I was excited, but it didn't take long for a, a, just a wave. I, just, I got bombarded with negative thoughts, thinking, oh, man, how are we going to do this? This, this, this? this is too big for me. And then sat down with the architect and found out how long it was going to take and how much it was going to cost. Then I got depressed. <laughs> thinking, man, there's no way this is going to happen. And all of a sudden, I gave into that kind of thinking, and man, I lost my joy. I was edgy with Connie and probably others too, and uh, I, I just didn't see a way out. And, and it was, you know, I thought, man, building programs are tough on a church. People are going to start getting mad at each other. They're going to get it mad at you. You know, it it's, it's, takes a toll on a pastor. My pastor friends tell me, building programs, wow, get ready for that. It's just a difficult process. And I thought, man, I'm 56. I could easily just keep pastoring 500 people and just kind of drift off into the sunset. That'd be the easy way. Man. And I gave into that kind of thinking, and I had to learn what I'm asking you to do is to not look at the present situation and go by your feelings, but to begin thanking God ahead of time. Thanking God that, you know, there's going to be a building on that land. Thank you that that land is going to be more pr- fruitful than it ever dreamed it could be. Thanking God ahead of time that he's in your corner, that, that he's going to help you with that legal problem, that he's going to help you restore that relationship with your spouse, that he's going to help you in your relationship with your teenagers. Begin thanking God that that it's on the way, that it's going to happen. See, God wants his promises to come to pass. He wouldn't wouldn't give us a promise if, if he didn't intend for it to come to pass, but he's looking for people who will thank God before the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Oh, I'm sure there were a lot of bandwagon 
guys got on the bandwagon after the walls fell. But how about the faith that believed before the walls fall? Faith to believe before Isaac came. Faith to believe before there's a building on that land. Faith to believe before that child comes to your home. Faith to believe that he's going to help you in that legal situation. Faith to believe that healing is on its way. But the mistake that we make way too often is we get filled with worry when it doesn't look good. And then what happens is we start begging God. You know, please give us that building. God, please give us that, that baby. God, please, you know, give me that wife. Give me that husband. And we start begging. There's a difference between praying and begging. And begging does not get God's attention. See, when you pray for something, God remembers your prayer. You don't have to keep begging for the same thing over and over. God, you know, I've been praying for this. And some people, they'll, they'll pray the same thing in the same way for decades. When you pray, God's got a good memory. He doesn't forget. When you, when you pray for something, you don't need to keep praying anymore. Now, you thought you'd never hear your pastor say that, right? When you pray for something, God's got, he, he remembers it the first time. Now what you have to do is you have to shift over into thanking God ahead of time. Switch over into praise that it's already on its way. That's what faith is. Believing that what you have prayed is on its way. So instead of focusing on what you don't have by praying and praying, praying over what you don't have, focus on what God intends you to have. Switch over into praise instead of, uh, instead of begging all the time. There's a difference between begging and believing. Believing that God is going to provide the answer on the way. That's what Abraham had to do. He didn't keep praying for a son. God gave him that promise, and he thanked God, and he praised God through the 24 years. I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure he was discouraged from time to time. But God even helped him by changing his name. Remember that passage? Look, at it. it says, the Bible says, this is my covenant with you. Abraham, God speaking to Abraham, I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. He didn't get that promise till he was in his 70s. Think about that, all the 70-year-olds here. <laughs> Thinking that you're going to be a father or a mother again. Scary thought, isn't it? <laughs> but he says, what's more, I'm going to change your name. It's no longer going to be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham. And you'll be the father of many nations. Abraham means father of many. So every time uh, somebody used his name, Abraham, it was a reminder of God's promise. Every time Abraham introduced himself, I wonder if he ever wanted to just go back to Abram because, you know, whenever he'd say, I'm Abraham, because it took 13 more years after this before he had, before he, he was the father of one, Isaac. I wonder if he ever thought, oh, I, don't, I don't see that. Uh, maybe I'll just go back to Abram. But no, God said, I'm changing your name. So every time you introduce yourself as Abraham, it's a reminder of God's promise to you that, that I will come through, that you'll be the father of many. So don't call yourself anything less than God thinks about you or God believes about you. You know, you're not dumb. You're not an idiot. You're not incompetent. You're wise. You're smart. You're competent. You've got the ability. You're capable to fulfill God's destiny for your life. Don't believe something of yourself that God doesn't think or believe about you. I think of another story in Matthew chapter 15 when this woman who had a sick daughter came to Jesus. Matthew 15. Uh, and uh, she was begging Jesus to heal her daughter. And it's oddly enough that Jesus ignored the lady. He gave no reply. And his disciples must have picked up on it because they're like, Master, send this Gentile woman, send her away. She's bothering us. Because she's, she's begging. And all of a sudden, something happened because she shifted from begging because she knew that begging wasn't getting the response she wanted. So she began to worship Jesus at his feet. And something happened when she shifted from begging to worshiping Jesus. That caught Jesus' attention immediately, and he rewarded her faith, 
and her daughter was made well. When begging doesn't work, try praise. Try thanking God ahead of time for the miracle that, on, that is on its way. Don't be a beggar. Instead, be a believer. Because a beggar, I, I want you to just sit, sit with this for a moment, because a beggar, what? Focus on what you don't have. You're always begging for what you don't have. See, the focus of a prayer that is just pleading and begging, it's the same thing over and over. You're focusing on what you don't have. Whereas being a believer, having faith, is focusing on what God wants you to have. Don't you want to be a believer? Somebody who knows God's word is good. He's a good father. I, I remember when our, our daughters wanted their first iPhone. Oh, my goodness, they were so excited. And, you know, we are going to get them one. And I don't know that we really indicated that we were going to, you know, get them for Christmas, and, and, but they kept on bugging us. They were begging, 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 Dad, we, Mom, Dad, we want an iPhone, we want an iPhone, until we finally had to have a conversation a couple weeks before Christmas and said, would you stop begging? Because really, we know that parenting, in parenting, begging doesn't work, does it? Well, begging shouldn't work, right? Oh, come on, let's be real here. Begging works, doesn't it? <laughs> they beg and beg so much, you're like, okay, stop bugging me. Here, have it. But they were bugging, they were begging, and we're like, okay, girls, if we hear it one more time, you're not getting an iPhone. And then all of a sudden, they must have caught on. And they, they began saying, oh, we can't wait. Oh, thank you, Mom and Dad, for you know, getting us that iPhone. I, I can't wait for Christmas. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're so, we're so preaching. All of a sudden, we're like, okay, what color do you want? <laughs> okay. You know, how many how megabyte memory do you want? I mean, it was just, you know, that was megabyte. Now it's gigabyte. I'm oh, sorry. Dated myself. But, you know, no, you know, when there's begging, it doesn't get the response. But God doesn't want us to beg. He wants us to have faith to believe that he's a good father. And why don't we believe God at, from the, right at the start when he, when he makes a promise to us, when, when there, there's a, something that we're believing for. And so that we don't become beggars, but we understand what it means to believe and that God will, he will do what he says he will do. That's the kind of father he is. I want to close with one more story. Maybe, Rachel, you come to the keyboard today. I need to hurry here. 1 Samuel 17, another great story. Uh, it's where the Philistines were on one mountaintop and the Israelites were on the other mountaintop. There was a valley in between. And that valley belonged to the tribe of Judah, and Judah means praise. But night and day, the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night, this big Philistine giant called Goliath would taunt God's people, would hurl insults at God's people, things like, you guys are going down, you're, you're never going to make it, we're going to destroy you. So night and day, they heard these, these taunts. That, that valley became a valley of intimidation, a valley of fear, a, a valley where it just struck fear into the Israelites until one anointed young man came along who he looked at the same valley and he knew that that valley didn't belong to fear. It didn't belong to intimidation. It didn't belong to discouragement. That valley belonged to the tribe of Judah. That valley belonged to praise. When you get an understanding that whatever valley you're in, that doesn't belong to fear. Kick the fear out in Jesus' name. That valley belongs to praise. And in the middle of your valley, begin to shift over into praise and thank God that there's no obstacle too big. Thank God that He's fighting with you and that you and Him are a majority and that no weapon formed against you will prosper. You own that valley. That valley does not belong to the enemy. And see, David... When he came up on the scene, he had a secret weapon. And it wasn't his slingshot in a stone. It, it was his ability to thank God for the past. Thanksgiving, right? He said, God, I thank you for rescuing me from the bear, from the lion. He was thankful for things of the path, past. But he didn't stop there. He was able to shift into thanking God for what was going to happen. Look what he said here. He says, 
You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And now watch him shift into thanking God ahead of time for what was going to take place. Nobody else, everybody else was living in fear and discouragement. The giant was arrogant, overconfident. He had no idea what was coming. But look at in the heart of little David, he had a heart not only of gratitude, but he had, a, he had an ability to see what God wanted to do. Today, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Again, he's not going on his own confidence. The verse before, he, he, he gave honor to God and the strength of God, right? And now he's walking in that authority. You have the ability to walk right down into that valley and have the authority over that valley and declare that valley is not a valley of defeat, not a valley of defeat. It's a valley of praise. But it has to be on your lips and it has to be in your mind. Nobody's going to do it for you. You won't, won't wake up one day and all of a sudden have this faith. It's something that you've got to cultivate. It's something that you've got to understand that praise breaks the, uh, uh, the chains that, that bind us, that, that opens prison doors, that open up the supernatural. You're not going to get anywhere with negativity and complaining and pessimism. You won't be a good parent being that kind of way. you got to instill not just the do's and don'ts, but you've got to give a picture for your children what they can be and what you are as a husband and wife will be the best sermon and best modeling for them to see this is what it could look like. Or they're going to say, that's not what I want my future to look like. See, we have to shift over into praise. And he goes on, this very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And this is what makes your influence so effective, is when you go through that valley and you don't fall apart and you keep your faith and your faith actually gets stronger. That's the way the whole world will know who, what kind of God you serve, what kind of faith you have. I love what Paul said in Romans, and I'll close with this verse. Despite all these things, despite COVID, despite all the things we've experienced in 2020, guess what? Your attitude makes a difference. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ. Overwhelming victory. It's not a nail biter. It's not a Hail Mary at the end of the game hoping that you pull it out. It's a blowout. <laughs> It's overwhelming victory. It's not even close. Even if they kill this body, they can't kill this soul. Amen? His loving kindness and faithfulness lasts forever. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet here today? And whatever valley you found yourself in, don't deny it. <laughs> Acknowledge it. But understand that fear and discouragement and depression does not belong in that valley. That valley belongs to you. That valley belongs to praise. So let praise come out of your mouth this morning. And let's tell fear to go. Let's tell that giant to go. Let's take that anxiety to go. And, and out of the very mouths that we have, begin to shift over to 